Welcome to today's webinar, Advocating for and Creating Effective Public Transit, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning on behalf of the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. My name is Michael Bayer. I am Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will post it on our website in the next couple days under the webinar archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to get smart growth news and information and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also learn about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is Advocating for and Creating Effective Public Transit. You can also search for event number 919 9985. Would also like to acknowledge our partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. Participants of today's webinar are eligible for a discount on books in the Island Press catalog by visiting islandpress.org and using the code webinar. So to get started, our speakers today are Christoph Spieler and Stephen Higashide. Christoph Spieler is Vice President and Director of Planning at Hewitt Zollers in Houston and a Senior Lecturer at Rice University. Christoph was a member of the Board of Directors of Houston's Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County, or Metro, from 2010 to 2018. As Chair of Metro's Strategic Planning Committee, he initiated the transit system reimagining process. Since Mayor Anise Parker appointed him to the board in 2010, Metro has successfully obtained $900 million in federal funding for light rail and initiated a new BRT project in a major job center. He was reappointed by Mayor Sylvester Turner in 2016. At Hewitt Zollers, he works on a variety of land use and transportation projects. His recent work includes park planning for the Houston Parks Board and project management of a consortium of researchers addressing flooding in Houston. Christoph has written and spoken extensively on transit and urban planning. He teaches courses in architecture and civil engineering at Rice University. As a member of the American Public Transit Association's Sustainability and Urban Design Working Group, he has helped to draft national standards on transit and urban design. He is also a contributor to NACTO's Transit Street Design Guide and is a board member at the Transit Center in New York. Christoph holds a BS and an MS in civil engineering from Rice University. He lives in downtown Houston and relies on transit and walking for most of his daily trips. Stephen Higashide is one of America's leading experts on public transportation and the people who use it. He is director of research for Transit Center, a New York-based foundation that supports innovations in urban transportation across the country. He directs Transit Center's research aimed at measuring American attitudes toward public transit and develops policy guides and workshops that help cities enact transit supportive policy. Stephen has worked on sustainable transportation issues for 13 years, including a Transportation for America and the Tri-State Transportation Campaign. His work has helped to preserve and increase federal funding for public transportation, win new legal protections for people walking and biking, and redefine how decision makers and journalists understand transit. He has an urban planning degree from New York University, is a member of the Transportation Research 
Board's Committee on Transportation Demand Management and was named to the Association for Commuter Transportation's 40 Under 40. He has taken the bus in 30 cities around the U.S. and the world. Following the presentations, Christoph and Stephen will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during the presentations by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christoph. Welcome, Christoph. Hi, I'm very happy to be here and talk about the book and talk about transit. And I'm really looking forward to the Q&A afterwards. Um, so this is this is my life in Houston. It's probably not what you expect from Houston. Um, I live in downtown Houston. I work in downtown Houston. And there you can see the train that I'm able to use to make my daily commute when we are not in a time of a global pandemic. Um, and the reason I care about transit is fundamentally that transit makes better cities. As Jarrett Walker would say, transit has an inherent geometry which works well with livable urban places. If you look at this street in Houston right here, the, all of those cars you see on the right added together hold about 40 people in them, and the train on the left holds 400. Transit has inherent space efficiency, which you really start to realize when you realize that the average office worker has less space in their cubicle than their car has in the parking garage. And as a result of that, transit is at the center of every economically successful metropolitan area in the world. Transit makes cities work. But transit also makes people's lives work. Transit is a basic safety net. It is something that is there for people who need it. It is something that gives people the opportunity to access jobs. It is something that gives people the opportunity to access education, to live all of their daily needs. Transit is freedom, transit is access to life. And so good transit really matters for good cities and good transit really matters for equity. What I did in the book was look at every US city that has rail or bus rapid transit, map them all to the same scale, look at population density, look at their systems and look at which ones have done well and which ones haven't. Why did they make the decisions they did and how did those decisions turn out? And, and then I also talk about what makes for successful transit. So I'll go through that today. We have built a lot of transit in the United States. We are now in a world where most cities um, have some form of bus network and um, most nearly every large metropolitan area has some form of rail transit or BRT. But the success of those systems is very mixed. Um, you will see some cities dramatically outperform their peers, some cities dramatically underperform their peers. Look at where Seattle sits compared to Phoenix, for example, or Minneapolis compared to Cleveland. And some of that is development patterns but some of that is also the decisions that those cities made when they built their transit networks, when they chose where to operate transit. And I would say that comes down to some very basic things that make for successful transit. Density, activity, walkability, connectivity, frequency, travel time, reliability, capacity, and legibility. So I'm gonna talk about each of those. The first and probably most important is density. What gives you ridership on transit is having people be near that transit. So here you can see Honolulu and their footprint of frequent transit. It's just about a perfect picture there. A nice dense concentration of people between the ocean and the mountains and a transit network that provides frequent service in those places. Um, and it is not a surprise that Honolulu is a very high performer when it comes to transit. But when we think about density, it's very specific. Um, this is the way we often tend to think of metropolitan areas. Here's Dallas, here's their rail lines overlaid on population density, but it's not the lines that matter, it's the stations. What that system is actually granting you is a series of little quarter, half mile walking distance bubbles around each of those stations. The people who are within those bubbles have access to that transit and are what's going to drive ridership. Now, when I talk about density, I think we often have preconceptions of what that looks like. And I think it's really important to emphasize that sometimes density isn't what we think it will look like. And here's some examples from Houston. The thing on the left, um, mid-rise and high-rise apartments, everybody knows that looks like density. 
But if you go into the middle, a fairly dense, walkable streetcar suburb from the 1920s, that actually achieves roughly the same level of density as those high-rise apartments over there because mixed in with those high-rise apartments are surface parking lots. So density can take very different forms and often very unexpected ones. You look on the right, that is actually the densest census tract in the state of Texas. And it is a series of suburban apartment complexes. So I think one thing we often get wrong with transit is not actually paying attention to the data on where the density is. Density doesn't always look like what we expect it to look like. And when we're talking about density, we also have to keep in mind that it's not the transit agency making the most important decisions here, it's planners. The zoning and development ordinances for any city determine how useful that transit system can be. Here's Portland, Oregon, famously transit friendly. Everything in yellow is zoned as single family. What that means is the city of Portland is legally limiting how many people are allowed to live near transit. But it's not just population, it's everything else we do. It is the centers of activity in our cities. And again, these take very different forms. Here's a couple of examples in Houston. We all know that downtowns are major centers of employment and activity, and nearly every transit system focuses on serving those downtowns. But there's a lot of other centers as well. We can think of suburban employment centers, like here you can see Uptown in Houston. Um, a lot of cities have multiple nodes of employment. Another really big one is hospitals, major drivers of employment, major drivers of trips, and often not very well served by transit. And the same goes for universities. It's interesting, if you look on the right, the university doesn't even show up in the density chart because students is not something we map in the census. But guess what? Students travel just like workers do. And so successful transit systems connect these kind of nodes together. Here's the green line in Boston, highest performing light rail system in the United States. It goes to downtown, it goes to Back Bay, another major employment center, it goes to three universities, it goes to a major medical center. Serving all of those kind of places makes transit more successful and serving all kinds of trips. We have a tendency when we talk about transit to talk about home to work trips, but those added up are less than a quarter of the trips that Americans make. It's all those other trips, the shopping, the errands, the school, church, recreation. Transit systems that serve all of those trips end up being high ridership transit systems. Um, and it's also important to note that not all work is the same. A lot of systems are very focused on nine to five commutes, but service jobs work all sorts of hours. Um, there's people working on Sunday, there's people working in the evening. Next, walkability, because it doesn't matter if you serve activity and if you serve density, if people can't get from there to transit. Every high ridership transit system is dependent on walking. And that's number one, every transit trip is gonna be a walking or biking trip on at least one end of the trip. Even if you drive to transit, you're not gonna have a car waiting for you at the other end. But secondly, walking is an extraordinarily efficient way to feed people into transit. Even transit systems that are heavily oriented towards park and ride systems where the station locations and the design of the stations were planned around parking, often get much of their ridership from other, other sources. Here's BART in San Francisco. There you can see the El Cerrito del Norte station and notice that the surroundings of the station are all parking. Um, and that's typical for BART. 36 out of 48 stations have parking, nearly 50,000 parking spaces on the entire system. Yet even on a car oriented system like that, nearly half the morning trips start with walking, biking or transit to the station. And so that means we have to think about pedestrian infrastructure as an integral part of transit infrastructure. Here's a $300 million light rail line and a obviously inadequate sidewalk leading to it. And on the right, you can see what that looks like today and you can tell what kind of difference that makes. And we also have to focus about putting transit in the middle of walkable areas. Here's MARTA in Atlanta doing it right, rather than the rail line following the easy freight rail corridor, it swerves off into the middle of downtown Decatur, so people end up right in the middle of where they can walk to. Next, connectivity. 
every transit system functions as a system, not as individual lines. And if you look at high ridership, bus rapid transit and rail lines, the reason they're high ridership is because they function as part of a larger system. And understanding that system connectivity is incredibly important. Here's Boston, for example, color coding bus routes in terms of how they feed into the rapid transit lines. And you can see how that system is designed around using those rapid transit lines as a core for the entire network. And those bus connections make those rail lines more useful. Those rail lines make the bus routes more useful. And you are starting to see cities really take this seriously. This is Richmond, Virginia, which redesigned their entire bus network around a brand new bus rapid transit system, which meant that a lot more people were able to benefit from that BRT because the surrounding route network was now designed for it. But that only works if you truly integrate everything. Here's Philadelphia and color coded by how much it costs you to go to downtown Philadelphia. The cost is going to depend on whether you took bus or rail. It's going to depend on whether you made a transfer or not. And it's going to depend on which agency you take. This is a system where the fares are actively working against making that system easy for people to use. Next frequency, if you are a transit rider, you know how much this matters and it really shows up in ridership. Las Vegas, Nevada, for example, dramatically outperforms its peers in terms of transit ridership and it's because they have a good network of frequent buses serving the densest parts of that city and connecting them to the major employment centers. It's important though to note on frequency what actually matters here. Frequency is not volume. Um, a lot of transit planners tend to talk about this is how many trains a day we're running here. And this, for example, is the New Jersey commuter rail system. But the actual experience of that depends on what's running at the moment you're there. So if you look at um, the Northeast Corridor commuter rail line going into New York City from Elizabeth, 57 trains a day. Average, that means a train every 22 minutes, but the maximum wait is actually 50 minutes which means if you have the bad luck to show up to the station at the wrong moment, you may be there for an awfully long time. This is not frequency that people can depend on. Frequency that's simply added in order to maximize capacity or match capacity to ridership is not frequency that makes people's lives better. And you could imagine with just a slight increase in service, they could actually deploy that so there was a train every 20 minutes all day, and that would be a much more useful service. Our goal should be transit where people can walk up and know that transit will be there when they need it rather than transit people need to plan their lives around. Travel time. It's not about speed, it's about the entire trip. You walk, you wait, you ride, you walk. And what we should be optimizing is door-to-door -door transit time. And there's a lot of tools for doing this. Making a route straighter makes it faster. Getting a route out of traffic makes it faster. Reducing stops makes a route faster, but now we're in the realm of trade-offs. If you reduce those stops too much, you're actually making trips slower because people have to walk further. Getting the right balance of stop spacing is absolutely important. If your stops are uselessly close together, you're not doing anyone any good. If you're they're too far apart, you're not serving people. And the same set of trade-offs apply to grade separation. You can make transit faster by grade separating it, but if you are compromising on location by doing that, if you are putting that transit further away from the destinations in an attempt to make it easier to grade separate, you may actually be driving away riders. And we can make transit faster by adding express service, but that only works if both the express and the local service are frequent. If you're taking a frequent service and chopping it up into two infrequent services, you're not helping either because you're not working on that wait time. And travel time is also really closely associated with reliability. Reliability drives people away from transit. Unreliable transit is what causes people to lose their jobs. And so just like with speed, we have to think about reliability in terms of everything transit does. This is data from a bus route in Minneapolis, St. Paul. 23% of the time, the bus was sitting at a red light. 42% of the time moving or in traffic, 32% of the time boarding. We can make every one of those faster and more reliable. We can make transit faster really easily by giving it its own lane. And that also makes a huge difference in terms of reliability. I would argue that the bus lane is the most 
underrated and underappreciated transit technology we have. You can deal with traffic signals, give buses signal priority, even do things like here in Grand Rapids where a bus can turn from the right-hand lane and make a left turn, which means it doesn't have to merge across into the other lane and can stop near the intersection and that service will be more reliable. And we can make boarding more reliable. All-door boarding, off-board fare co collection will mean that people can board quicker and the size of that crowd doesn't make as much difference in how long the bus is there. Even simple things like more generous wheelchair boarding pads can make a huge difference in that boarding time. Capacity. We talk about capacity when it comes to transit far too much. It turns out transit actually has huge capacity. Here is the comparison of a single occupant vehicle lane in a city with traffic signals compared to the capacity ranges of local bus, BRT, light rail, heavy rail. Um, and you can see with the local bus range, we can get many times the capacity of a standard vehicle lane with transit. Most of the time, capacity should not be the driving issue. It should be things like reliability and speed and comfort. But there are those moments when capacity really matters. Ottawa just converted um, from BRT to light rail because the downtown streets were the major bottleneck on their BRT system, and putting light rail in a tunnel lets them carry two times as many people per hour. Um, and so one thing that's really important for transit agencies to do is understand where their capacity needs are. Um, figure out where the high ridership corridors are, focus on upgrading those. But when we talk about upgrading, that doesn't necessarily mean you spend billions of dollars. One of my favorite approaches to transit is what the Germans have articulated as Organisation vor Elektronik vor Beton, which means organization before electronics before concrete. If you have to solve a transit problem, if you have a capacity problem, for example, the first thing you do is see how you can operate better. The second thing you can do is see what electronics you can apply to make it function better. And only if those two don't work, you start building concrete. A really good example here, the most frequent commuter rail line in North America is the Trillium line in Ottawa on the left, which at its Bayview terminus handled 180 trains a day on a single platform track. On the right, you can see Caltrain in San Francisco handling half as many trains on a station with 12 tracks. There is huge unused capacity in that right-hand station if you operate that system more efficiently. And I find that a lot with transit systems that we're spending lots of money to upgrade things where better organization, better operations would do a much better job. And then legibility. A good transit system is easy to understand. This is one of my favorite examples in LA. You can see everything you need to know. You can look down the street and see the Santa Monica Pier and the beach where you're going. You can see the path that takes you there. You can see the station and the trains telling you where it's going. The simple aspects of good passenger information matter so much. This is the A-Line in Minneapolis, St. Paul. What you see here is a station that tells you everything you need to know. You have fare information, you have schedule information, you have next bus arrival information, you have a bus stop sign that tells you which direction the bus is going. I would estimate over half the bus stop signs in the United States don't give you that basic information. It's as if freeways had a sign on them that said, you know, I-5 North, instead of saying I-5 North, it simply said I-5 and it relied on you to guess correctly which direction that ramp was going into. Um, and it has a name for the station, which makes it a lot easier to navigate. And it's not just passenger information, it's the inherent design of systems. Here is a little chunk of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, if you look at the number 64 bus, there are five different variations of that bus. In some cases, they're on the same street, but headed in opposite directions. Um, we're expecting people to figure this out. And if you make transit systems easier to figure out, more people will ride them. And finally, and critically importantly, inclusivity. A good transit network makes all sorts of riders feel welcome. And that means obviously a good transit network is accessible. It means if you're in a wheelchair, you can get on that and sad, sad to say, we can't rely on that yet. The New York subway has tremendous issues with accessibility. Um, it also means other things like stroller policies. If you're trying to board a bus with a stroller, most transit agencies expect you to fold the stroller, which means you're going to have to have one hand for your stroller, one hand for your kid, and a third hand, which I guess you don't really have, um, tapping the fare box with your fare card. A 
better stroller policy, which will just let you roll on board, makes that transit system more welcoming. And this is where concerns of equity and concerns of race also become critically important. You've seen this with transit agencies that try to enforce proof of payment fare systems with armed police officers. And if I'm an upper middle class white man, I'm going to be a lot less concerned about that than if I live in a historically over police minority neighborhood. This is also part of why it's so important that transit decision makers reflect the diversity of the transit systems that they plan. All of this is really simple. If you ride transit, you know these things already. But if you look at transit in the United States, you will see that there's a huge range of ridership among systems with the same technology. Some cities have spent their money and gotten a lot and some cities have spent their money and gotten very little. Transit planning is actually really simple. I, I've said before that if you look at a city, it's actually a bar graph of density. All you have to do is get on a hill and you will see the places you need to connect. You look at population density, you look at employment centers, um, and then you draw lines between them. But in reality, we are not very good at this. Um, this is light rail running through cornfields in St. Louis. This is not a high ridership light rail line. And in fact, if you look at where we have built rail transit, you will notice that often those lines actually avoid the density. I, this looks a little bit like airliners dodging thunderstorms. Um, and you can see in city after city, we're putting transit where it doesn't do the most good. Why is that? First of all, we have way too many arguments about bus versus trains. We have way too many projects which start of with a goal like our city needs a light rail line rather than a goal like we have a dense corridor from point A to B that we want to have more frequent or reliable service in. We plan single purpose transit. We talk about things like commuter rail and plan it for very specific groups of users like white collar professionals who work nine to five in Manhattan rather than planning transit which is useful for a whole different mix of people. That's what makes transit high ridership. We hurry through system planning. The decisions about which parts of the city to serve don't get nearly as much attention as the details of each individual line. And that is the most important decision, which corridors you're going to serve matters more than anything else. We don't think about networks. We plan things as individual lines rather than as a part of an interconnected network. We don't use data. We have an awful lot of information about where people live and where people work and where people are riding. And far too often the decisions instead are made based on hunches, are based on decision makers' preconceived notions of what a place looks like. We think at too large a scale. We have a tendency to design transit lines that look impressive on a map, but often those really long far-flung lines are not the ones that'll get us ridership and focusing in the core in the denser areas will have a much greater return. We think about paths, not destinations. We think about building along existing freeways and rail lines, but say you're building along an existing freight rail line like this one in Dallas, it's likely going to be surrounded by things like warehouses rather than destinations that people are going to. And we avoid opposition. This happens on all sorts of scales. Here's an example in Houston, where the fight was, do you build the rail line down the middle of a busy street in the midst of all of the major destinations, or do you build it along an abandoned railroad right of way? So this happens in the big decisions, but it happens in the little ones too. Here's riders in San Francisco boarding a light rail train by dodging around parked cars because the local residents did not want to lose four parking spaces and convinced their city government to have a completely unsafe light rail stop in order to save their parking that's benefiting four people a day. It comes up whenever we think about making decisions on bus routes. Are we going to simplify a route in a way that benefits the most riders? We're not good at having these decisions and often really good proposals get killed in the politics of how we discuss them. And things get killed for all sorts of reasons. Why are these people in New Orleans at the biggest transfer hub in the city? Why don't they even have a bus shelter? Well, it's because of the politics of determining where a center city transit hub might be located. And I could say all of this and come out really pessimistic, but in looking at the book, what I actually saw was opportunity. In city after city, Every city has dense places that merit frequent service. Every city has multiple activity centers to connect. 
We have infrastructure that could provide much better service. We have fleets of vehicles that could provide much better service and we can improve the transit experience everywhere. And it goes back to where I started with the basics of what transit does well. And now you might say, I've only mentioned COVID once and how does that change the world? How does this virus we are living with right now change everything? And I would argue that in a lot of ways, it doesn't change what we've talked about. None of the truths we just articulated change. I don't think land use patterns are gonna change that dramatically. I don't think that the way people move about and where they're trying to go to is going to change that dramatically. We are in the midst of a short-term crisis for transit, but I would argue that we should not lose sight of our long-term goals. And I would also say that as we are thinking of how to respond to this crisis, Realizing the basics of what makes good transit is more important than ever. Right now, transit is keeping places in New York running by getting those essential workers to where they need to go. And as long as we do that, as long as we focus on not trains and buses, but focus on the people who use them, we can make better transit that will help people every day. And with that, I will pass this off to Stephen. All right. Thank you, Christoph, and thanks to the Smart Growth Network for having me. Um, you know, my book really focuses on why good bus service matters, what that actually looks like, and how we can achieve it. You all just heard a really amazing primer and overview of what quality transit service looks like, so I'm really going to focus on the first and the third part of that story. Um, in pre-COVID times, Americans were taking about 4.7 billion trips on buses every year. And yet, so many of those trips were miserable. They're circuitous, unreliable, slow. You're asking people sometimes to stand on the side of an unpaved street or in the sun and the weather without shelter. and Doing so really hinders our ability to solve some of the most pressing issues facing our cities and society, including climate change. We know that transportation is now the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And when you zoom in on transportation, we're really talking about personal transportation. We're not talking about, you know, primarily the need to do things like build high speed rail or reduce you know, air emissions. It's really about the decisions we make every day, the trips we make every day, our everyday economy. And we also know that when you look at climate modeling at any scale, whether that's at the local, state, national, or international level, we cannot address emissions and transportation purely through electrifying the vehicle fleet. This is an example from the California Air Resources Board showing that uh, not only would every car in California have to be zero emissions by 2050, but also that, we, that in California, we have to build the types of cities and neighborhoods for people to drive less, about 15% less in that case. And that's true when you look at many other states and countries. We know that bus service and transit are really essential in confronting urban inequality. You know, Christoph, alluded to this, I want to put um, a few numbers behind it. So many of the cities that we live in and work in are like New Orleans, where if you have access to a personal vehicle, you can get to jobs, you can get what you need in life. And if you don't, the opportunities that are available to you are just so much smaller. And bus service and transit plays a huge role in remedying that. Um, Christoph sort of talks about a version of this that, that transit is really important for the efficiency of our cities, that cities really cannot scale around a car-based system, or at least if that's what you have, in order to scale, you actually end up having to destroy much of what makes a city a great place. You have to destroy neighborhoods to build 10-lane freeway and 10-story parking garages. 
I will say, you know, one thing that is changing in this moment is that um, we are in a moment temporarily where there's less capacity in all modes, but it affects transit to a greater degree. And we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of urgency, a lot of ingenuity to make sure that we're operating transit in ways that are safe, including by helping people understand how to socially distance on transit. It does mean that for a time, some of that capacity is going to be lost. However, it also puts into really, really sharp focus the need to have transit in order to keep essential workers and essential industries moving. This is analysis that we've done at Transit Center. My colleague Mary Buchanan has done at Transit Center. Transit commuters, you know, about a third of them before the pandemic were essential workers working in fields like healthcare, food distribution, logistics. These are now the folks who are making up the majority of transit riders and they are more likely to be low income, more likely to be people of color. It's just really, really clear that in this moment, transit is part of the public health response to the pandemic, and we can't shortchange it because shortchanging it means shortchanging our societal ability to withstand what is happening. Um, Christoph really did a great job of uh, providing the outlines of what makes effective bus service. I'll just I'll just note that you know in the book I talk about a lot of the research that underpins uh, what makes these attributes so important for transit riders, and it really is simple. We know how to do these. We know how to use techniques like redesigning our bus networks, putting bus lanes on the street, providing great shelters. We know how to do all of this, and yet. So often we don't see it on the ground. So often when we try to improve transit, we see things happen like really strong opposition from homeowners and businesses, sometimes expressed in the most uh, classist and racist terms about why transit shouldn't exist in their neighborhoods. We see that transit and transit riders are marginalized in our political processes, whether it's at that neighborhood level or when you zoom up all the way to the federal level and you look at the amount of funding that is provided, or you look at the fact that state departments of transportation essentially get blank checks to spend their federal funding on road projects, whereas very often transit agencies have to go hat in hand to the voters. That's a huge structural difference, and it says a lot about whose needs are centered in the politics. Um, and so, so much of what I wrote about in the book was trying to tell the local stories of places that have successfully reformed transit and trying to help, um, help us sort of understand that it's really not enough to understand the technical aspects of what makes transit work, understand the, we have to understand the networks of power and how to build it and how even as you know, even professionals in the in the public sector, there's a lot that public sector professionals can do to help build power for reform. Everywhere I looked and everywhere I spoke to people, and those included places like Miami, Houston, Indianapolis, Seattle, anywhere where I saw real transformative change in transit, it happened through alliances across sectors. On the one hand, outside advocates, social movements, civic organizations on the other side really motivated champions inside the bureaucracy inside public agencies as well as support from elected leaders and there are ways in which each of these groups can pressure and support all of the others to make better transit happen um i you know i i talk about examples that have to do with all of the 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 fundamentals that that were mentioned, whether it's you know walking, frequent walkability, frequency, affordability. In this presentation, I want to focus on uh, sort of apply these lessons to one aspect of transit service planning that's really important in this moment, which is transit priority, speeding up transit on the street. So often, um, when we are planning a bus lane corridor project, the process to do it 
has been set up in a way that's very similar to a highway or transit mega project. This is the this is the 16th Street Northwest bus lanes project in Washington D.C., which is was has been talked about since 2009, but actually is not even on the ground yet. So it spanned multiple presidential administrations, and this really puts both transit riders and transit agencies on the back foot in a lot of ways. We're asking people to um, show up for multiple rounds of public meetings. We have to go through 30% design, full design, final design. What does that mean from a power perspective? It means that it is actually really hard to do equitable engagement, really hard to reach out to the kind to the people who will benefit for this project because the folks living in this neighborhood, they may not even be there in five years. Why are they going to show up for year after year of public meetings when we know from experience that these are dominated by more privileged stakeholders, often who are frankly harassing, obnoxious? It's not something that is easy for public agency staff to go through, and it's certainly not easy for transit riders to go through and the media often picks up on that as well one trend that i've seen in the last few years which is really really important and i, I think really um, can help helps us see a way out of this is the rise of tactical transit where rather than going through years of study before putting anything on the ground transit agencies are using cones using paint to create bus corridors immediately and get and use that opportunity to get feedback from riders in that moment. This becomes really important first because when you put cones on the ground, immediately there are hundreds and thousands of people who are benefiting and who are excited. You're immediately getting actual data about the improvements that and then the agency can use that to make the case to elected officials. This is an example from uh, bus lane in the Boston area, which has been one of the pioneers of this. It also creates a real opportunity for community-based organizations, allies. When the Boston Department of Transportation put some of their pop-up lanes in, a local community-based organization, the Livable Streets Alliance, uh, had volunteers out uh, for a couple of days a week for several weeks and that's really different from asking a community organization to show up for years. You know, you're just asking them to lean in for this intense period of about a month. They're building relationships with riders. They're directing rider feedback to people like the mayor and the Boston Transportation Department. And there are, you know, because there are all these excited bus riders who are experiencing the benefits, you're really working and building that constituency in real time. So just to summarize, this is sort of one example of how a different public process actually can really change the power dynamics of a transportation project. And I think it's really important to think about that um, when we think about all the different transportation projects we do, certainly not, not every transportation project can be a quick build tactical project but we can always think about how to design it in ways that make it easier for transit sort of allied organizations to build power um one of the things that was really and i think there's another aspect of building power which is really thinking about the capacity inside transportation agencies one of the really encouraging outcomes from the tactical projects in Boston was that it actually convinced the Boston Transportation Department that for the first time ever, they should hire an internal transit team. Before this, Boston was like so many other places where transit was seen as the transit agency's responsibility. Even though the city has this responsibility over streets and sidewalks, there was no single person inside Boston government whose responsibility it was to improve transit. That changed and it changed because of the success of those pop-up projects. And this is also true when you look at places that have a more established history of transit success, like Seattle, which over the last decade has become one of America's new transit success stories. One of the things that they do really well is bridge that silo 
King County Metro, which is the main bus operator, actually has an internal team of traffic engineers, which is quite rare in the transit world. But what they recognized is that outside of the city of Seattle, they also work with all these much smaller cities and towns who really don't have the internal capacity to take on traffic engineering projects designed to speed up transit. And so they have an in-house unit that essentially does house calls to all the smaller municipalities, works with them to understand why it's important to change the signal timing here or put in a queue jump there and helps them make the case up to their city manager or mayor and get the money spent and get the project in the ground. Conversely, the Seattle Department of Transportation, again, they don't control most of transit in Seattle, but their measures of success are really geared towards transit. And that creates you know, internal alignment and internal pressure. It's one of the, it has helped underpin uh, an internal transit unit at the Seattle Department of Transportation that has grown from you know, a couple of people in the mayor's office advising uh, the mayor on transit to a, a transit division within Seattle with dozens of people that is given the, the ability to work on a pipeline of street design projects. Um, where we eventually, where we have to get to and what can happen when you have both strong civic advocacy and strong capacity inside transportation agencies is what we're seeing in places like Portland, Oregon, where this year, the Rose Lane project, they approved 20 bus lane projects. We have to get out of the mindset of having one BRT project every five years and instead get to a place where we are continually improving transit performance on the street city-wide. And that's really important in this moment. Um, one of the examples that I keep thinking about comes out of San Francisco. You know, frankly, it's a moment that came out of triage. So I'm not quite sure if it is a model, but I think it's really instructive for the situation that we're in. The San Francisco Municipal uh, you know, Transportation uh, Agency has had so many transit operators call out sick or have to isolate that they were really facing this need to cut back dramatically on service. But what they did was not apply uh, an across the board cut they were really guided by data in focusing what service they had on the core transit routes serving essential trips and essential workers. And really importantly, they were also guided by an equity strategy that they had developed a few years before, informed by a lot of conversations with local advocates. Um, they had already made it a priority to prioritize service in neighborhoods with more low income people and more people of color. And so being prepared in that moment, having done the work, allowed them to work really rapidly, rebuilding the entire transit network over the course of a weekend to create this core service. And now they're looking ahead to the recovery. And you know, this quote is from Jeff Tumlin, who's the director. You know, we have to make it sure that this essential transit network is never stuck in traffic again, that these, it's time now to focus on bus lanes, bus bulbs, other street design elements to make sure that as traffic comes back, we don't consign essential workers to unreliable and unsafe transit, which you know is an urgent need. We are seeing if you there are now several data sources. What's on the right is uh, from Apple Maps, and I'm showing it for Chicago, but it's actually true if you look around at other at uh, other cities in the US, cities in Europe, cities in Asia, that driving is recovering while transit use is plateauing in this moment. I think it's really, really important for cities everywhere to get ahead of this and carve out space for transit now. Um, just to, to, to close, you know, one of the, whenever I'm invited into a place and asked to speak about power mm -hmm. and transportation, I always ask these three basic questions. Um, in many, you know, some regions have really strong networks of transportation advocacy groups. In other regions, there is much less of a history 
there. And I think in those situations, it's really important to, to ask ourselves, you know, in some situations, maybe it's not what we think of as a traditional transit advocacy group. Maybe it is, a, maybe it's faith-based leaders, you know, churches have ended up being incredibly important in winning expanded bus service in Indianapolis and Richmond, Virginia, for example. And, you know, we have to speak to our partners in the philanthropic world and ask whether we are focusing on systemic change. Uh, I look around at the transit advocacy groups that we work with at Transit Center and the transit agencies that we partner with. When I compare it to other sectors like housing, for example, we don't have as many networks and those networks aren't as well resourced. That's a really important role for philanthropy to step in. And we still have a situation where, you know, in many parts of the country, um, foundations are spending more on propping up essentially basic government functions and not enough on systemic change. This is an example from the Kresge Foundation in Detroit, which, for example, has spent tens of millions of dollars literally supporting the construction of a streetcar while not spending nearly as much on advocacy, which could make a huge role in winning. A regional transit system. And, you know, I, I think that from what I've heard, this has changed more recently, but I think it's an important example to bring up. Um, so in conclusion, you know, I just want to restate that the technical aspects of transit matter, but thinking a lot about the power dynamics matter too. And we are in a moment where not only do we have to build power, we have to use all of the power we have available to us to safeguard transit riders, to safeguard transit workers, to maintain the financial resilience of transit. We cannot respond to the COVID crisis in ways which hamper our ability to respond to the climate crisis and the crisis of urban inequality. If we get through this moment and build transit back even stronger, you know, we'll be doing a better job for our cities and the people who live there. So thank you, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Stephen. I'm wondering if we want to go ahead, we did have a poll question today. Do we want to go ahead and ask that before we get into the Q&A? Asking you, I think it was your question, Stephen, about transit use. I think it was, uh, it was actually Christoph's question. I'm certainly fine with asking the, uh, the poll okay, question. Christoph. Why don't we go ahead and run that poll this will give us some information here. So the poll question up here, in a normal world, how often do you ride transit? And the responses are daily, Monday through Friday, a few times per month, a few times per year, and never. So we'll give everybody yeah. a chance. Yeah, we had some information on the on on the the roles and demographics of who's attending. I was really curious how many frequent transit riders we have. Okay, so I'll give everybody a couple more seconds to respond. The responses are coming in. Of watching those. So once we close that, I'll read the response and then we'll go into the, the, to the next section. Okay, so the response is here, 28% uh, few times per year, 27% few times per month, 20% Monday through Friday, 13% daily, and 12% never. So quite a quite a split there. And I'll know when we ask a question like that, it's I don't think that question is about personal choice. I would bet a lot of the people who are answering that they rarely or never ride transit, that's a reflection of whether where they live or where they work, transit is a good option for them. Um, I think for the most part, transit ridership is based on whether we're providing good transit as an option for people, not a personal choice. And I think when we talk about it as a personal choice, we're actually doing a disservice to the policies discussions we need to be having. Great, okay. So we'll ask uh, both Christoph and Stephen to turn on their webcams as we move into the uh, Q&A portion. So and throughout the webinar, we have been getting questions, in fact, quite a number today. Uh, from the audience and you can continue to submit them as we move into the discussion and we'll go to about 2 30 and maybe a little over if we run out of time um, i guess to start if, uh, christoph and you and stephen want to kind of respond to each other's presentations a little bit um 
before we move into questions from the audience. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with my response sure. to Stephen, which is, I think he's focusing on the most critical thing here, is it is very easy to visualize what better transit looks like. Actually making it happen is incredibly hard. And I love that advocate perspective on, on ultimately making change happen involves changing the conversation. Um, and that, that's actually where I came from. I, I was appointed the Houston Metro Board as a result of writing a blog. I, I came from that advocacy world and I got from that world into a decision-making world. Now I'm in a consulting world and I've realized how much those worlds work together how good agencies do good things because they have advocates on the outside, both pushing and supporting the agencies, but also holding those agencies accountable. And there's a huge difference in the transit networks in cities that have well-organized advocacy and a strong political conversation around transit and the ones that don't. And so ultimately, if you want your city to have better transit, it's important for you to be one of those voices that makes that happen. Yeah, I'll just respond by saying that, um, you know, that, that technical understanding really is very important. And I so appreciate the way that Christoph lays it out, both in uh, his book and in his presentation. I've seen some versions of it. I do think that I, when I was maybe a younger advocate or when I look at uh, less experienced advocacy groups, sometimes there isn't quite as critical an understanding. And there's this much more, um, there's a sort of more simplistic understanding that spending money on roads is bad because it's bad for the climate. So spending money on transit must be good. And it actually really matters a lot how you spend it, where you put the corridors. I think that there is an element, uh, you could you could say that you know, every transit planner needs to understand a little bit about advocacy and power, and every advocate needs to understand something about transit planning. Yeah. No, no it's, 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 it's amazing to me how many misguided things I've seen. I've, I've seen in a case where a local Sierra Club chapter responded to a sprawl-inducing rail line that literally would raise carbon footprint and cause development in undeveloped areas and their only complaint about it was this doesn't have enough parking spaces um <laughs> and and that's coming from a place of people who are genuinely trying to do the right thing but really don't understand the dynamics of what they're dealing with and i also see that a lot with advocates that you see you see a lot of sort of defensive advocacy framed around preserving the status quo which is very understandable since I think often transit advocates have had to deal with agencies trying to make things worse. Um, but the kind of advocacy around save the number 68 bus is usually not the advocacy that will actually result in a better transit network. And, and, and the advocacy groups I've seen are really proactive and active. They have agendas and they clearly frame those agendas engage on a higher level than one individual route or one individual decision. Okay, thank you. I will note that we did get a number of comments about the poll questions, kind of looking at some of the nuances. A couple comments of saying that they would ride more transit in their home areas than if it were more available, and they do use transit more when they travel. Uh, a couple others would take transit if it was more convenient and frequent. Um, and then, you know, that th maybe there were other answers that we didn't quite represent, which I'm sure um, you would understand. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so to move into the Q&A, I guess we'll, we'll start with a um, more general one for you, Christoph. What is the connection between improved transit and urban population growth? There are lots of connections, but there's also lots of non-connections. Um, so I think one thing we can very clearly say is that there is a level of growth and density that is only possible with transit. Um, and in that sense, sometimes we undersell transit. Like I hear people talking about transit-oriented development. I, 
you know, the entire man island of Manhattan is transit-oriented development. It simply would not be possible without transit. So I think on one level, transit can function as sort of the basic infrastructure that supports a certain level of development. Um, you can also obviously see lots of cases where individual transit decisions lead to new development, lead to changes in the development market. Um, in Houston, we've seen billions of dollars of new development along the light rail line. But I will note, and one slide I didn't include in the presentation today is actually like a really large TOD outside of Dallas where they built all this stuff around the station and ridership actually went down. Just building stuff next to transit isn't enough if that transit isn't frequent transit, if it isn't useful transit, if it doesn't connect to where people want to go. So I think there's definitely been a trend in some cities sort of seeing transit as a tool to make development happen and measuring success by development rather than measuring success by useful transit. Um, and a lot of those systems, those cities that have planned that way have actually found that the ridership doesn't show up. Um, and that if you really want to see new development around transit, often the best way to do it is to put transit in places where there's already lots of people, where there's already lots of movement. That the, the, the development follows transit shouldn't be an excuse to literally build transit through cornfields. Um, and it goes back to, I think, a really important discussion is what is your goal in building transit? Because I often find that transit systems absolutely accomplish their goals. And, Part of the reason why low ridership transit systems are low ridership transit systems is ridership wasn't actually their goal. Um, like I, I think Dallas is a good example where fundamentally their design goal was build as many miles of rail as possible and serve as many cities as possible. And they reached that goal admirably. Ridership was not one of the goals. Um, and, and so I think thinking about what we're trying to accomplish is incredibly important and realizing again that land use decisions are integral with transit, that what the rules are for building around transit. And when you see cities that, for example, require the same number of parking spaces in a development built next to a transit station that they do on a development built on a freeway frontage road out in the suburbs, clearly in those cases, those development regulations are working against making that transit more useful. Okay. Stephen, I don't need to add to that. Uh, you know. We talked about the uh, the non connections. I think one thing that's really obvious in a lot of the places that are um, very transit focused right now is that transit can't transit by itself doesn't solve the housing crisis that is also really constraining yep. growth in places like the Bay Area and New York, but seemingly in in many many places. And we are, I think, transit professionals really are seeing the suburbanization of poverty and the displacement of some of the most loyal users of transit. And dealing with that is very difficult if transportation is the only tool you have to address it, yep. that there's such a relationship between transportation and housing and affordable housing. And, um, you know, I think uh, transit advocates, what that means for us is doing a lot of work with housing advocates. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, what advice would you give to communities where transit as a shared value isn't appreciated or well understood? The examples you cite here are mostly the usual suspects, coastal cities with a different mindset. How can we get a new wave of communities on board? Um, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Christoph has some, some thoughts on this, but um, a couple of examples that I wrote about and didn't spend too much time talking about in the presentation were uh, Indianapolis and Miami. And you know, you might serve Miami as a coastal city, but it's it's not a place that has a huge transit culture. Um, I think in both of those places, advocates were extremely effective in framing the benefits of transit not necessarily as something that every single person was going to use. You know, you're you're not going to win over someone like the head of the Chamber of Commerce by claiming that, oh, you know, suits are gonna ride the bus in, in Indianapolis. But there was an incredibly effective 
coalition in Indianapolis that included on one side business leaders and on the other side progressive faith-based activists who talked about the fact that lack of access to transit was making Indianapolis a place that was less fair and also a place where businesses didn't have access to the workforce they needed. So making that argument that transit is really important for the overall health of the city, I think we really see that in the, in the, in the COVID era where it's so obvious that transit is keeping essential industries running, but that was true before the crisis, that transit played a huge role in, in uh, access to workforce and, and not just in the you know, millennials and talent way, but in the types of industries that actually keep uh, cities going. So it, a lot of it has to do with framing. And you know, just one other thing I'll add, um, I was recently looking at some polling about transit in Nashville, which had a really high profile failure of a transit tax at the ballot. What was interesting is that the, so much of the argument for transit that you know, boosters were making was about attracting talent, making Nashville a world-class city. If you actually look at some of the polling that was done, what really resonated with people was this idea of providing service for people who didn't have a car, for older riders. Even in a, you know, in a place like Nashville, it really actually really resonated this idea that we have to provide mobility for everyone. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I am very much not coming from a um from an elite coastal city background here i'm coming from houston and houston is very much a car based city um but houston has major transit success stories we um have a park and ride commuter bus network that is so good that of the people who work downtown and who live in the suburbs served by that network half of them choose to ride the bus um, we have a light rail line that's one of the highest ridership per mile of any light rail line in the United States. We reorganized, reimagined our local bus network in a way that ended up inspiring New York City. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential for transit in a big range of cities. And it's a part of the density discussion, too, that we have a tendency to sort of average cities we have a tendency to in our mind think of houston as low density and new york as high density but the reality is there are dense places in houston and there are very low density places in the new york metro area no city is one size fits all and i think part of what successful cities do is they identify the places that will work um, and this there um and in a funny way i often actually find that some of the best transit decisions are not being made in the cities we think of as the best transit cities. Like I would, New York is a poster child for that. I think New York has one of the most broken political cultures around transit of any place in the world. Some of the worst decision-making around transit of any place in the world. Um, even though it is without a doubt, America's strongest transit network. Um, and it's places like the Twin Cities, it's places like Seattle, where you see in places like Indianapolis and Richmond, Virginia, um, where you are seeing some really smart transit planning and some really smart projects. And I think often those cities, it's actually easier to get things done. Like in Houston, we don't have the kind of entrenched politics around these things so that we, we were able to have a mayor who said, I'm going to redesign every local bus route in Houston. And we're able to make that happen politically in a way that I think would have been a lot harder in cities like San Francisco or New York, um, where the politics are much more entrenched. Um, so what we're seeing in transit is we're seeing some real success stories in a huge range of cities. And I wouldn't look at any significant size metro area and give it up as a lost cause. And there's a reason why I included Grand Rapids on one of my slides. Like this is not where you'd expect a really nicely designed um, transit priority signal to be. but you are seeing small places do some really good work. Okay, thank you. Um, here's the next question, kind of uh, follows on what you were just saying. You've talked a lot, and I think referring to both of you, about bigger city transit and focusing on density and rail. I agree transit works best in dense areas. Any ideas for the suburban environment where lower income folks live in less dense areas not traditionally thought of as easily served by transit? Well, I mean, 
I actually think that um, one thing that all U.S. planters should be doing is taking a look at some of the Canadian metro areas where in suburban environments that in the U.S. we would often, you know, think of as, as we'd often provide hourly bus service. There's actually really frequent bus service, for example, in the Toronto suburbs and the ridership demand is there. And, you know, that's because there are destinations along those corridors. Um, I actually think that there is quite a lot of potential in the suburbs around the US to have more frequent service, whether that's in a legacy context, for example, if there's a commuter, like the commuter rail networks in the Boston or Philadelphia regions, but also just to provide frequent bus service, I think we would be perhaps a little surprised by the results. Agreed. And, and I think the frame of urban versus suburban is actually wrong here um, in that there are suburban areas with real density. There is post-World War II development with real density. And again, some of the cities that are really doing well here are taking that seriously. Like I think one of the things I love about Seattle right now is they're really thinking about connecting suburban employment centers together. They're really thinking about how major rail investments can be part of an overall transit network that spreads those across much larger areas. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities and places we think of as suburban, um, but some limitations here. The inherent street patterns of development matter a lot here. A cul-de-sac single family neighborhood will never work well for transit simply because the walking distances don't work. That if you can't get a direct route from where somebody lives to their nearest transit stop, it's not going to work. Um, so it's really important not to see a region as all the same thing, but rather to look at those places which even though they may feel suburban, the density is there. There is an ability to make walkability work, which might involve things like rede redesigning streets and adding crosswalks um, and focus on those places. And then finally, part of this is a housing policy problem. Like we are definitely seeing the, the, the like Stephen said, in, in places like the San Francisco Bay Area, that we are driving people who depend on transit pushing them out into suburbs where it is very difficult to provide good transit. And the easiest solution to that would be to build more housing in places where the transit is good. And there is so much potential to do that, but that goes to the heart of those politics. Any San Francisco Bay Area people have probably watched the saga of the um, Ashby Bart parking lot where you have a BART station in the midst of a dense walkable neighborhood that has a large surface parking lot, and that will now be housing instead. But the amount of political pushback they've had to deal with with that. But we should be looking for those opportunities. Um, and a lot of those areas we think of as suburban are actually much more urban than we think and have much more potential for transit than we think. Okay, so a little different type of question from Adrian Heim, who works for the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Christoph, have you reviewed safety and security as part of the items for good transit, specifically at bus, at bus stops and LRV and metro station? Region, reason being homeless issues are on the rise and many of the unhoused camp out at stations and bus stops, but they are also our customers and transit users. How can we work with our city family to make, and that references City Hall and other departments, to make sure our customers are feel safe riding transit. So I think Stephen will probably have more to add on this, but it's another issue that's very much like the housing issue in that the solution to homelessness is homes. That what we are dealing with right now is we are dealing with a larger social problem caused by bad government policy in a lot of ways. A, a bad housing policy, bad ho policy around mental illness, bad policy around drug abuse, there's real issues there. And transit agencies are bearing the brunt of it and do not have the tools to solve it. And I really hate security as a solution to homelessness because first of all, you have people who need some place to sleep and the solution to that isn't to chase them away. Um, 
but secondly, because it actually makes the system, it actually sort of amps up the hostility feeling of the entire system. And, you know, like the whole discussion of a fair evasion, for example, where you see agencies almost armoring stations to prevent fair evasion. What you're doing is you're making it all feel much less friendly to riders. Um, I think there's some examples of good programs. The, the Twin Cities have really been focused on sort of social services outreach on the transit system and dealing with homelessness. And I think they've had some success there. Um, it's a real problem, um, but it's not a transit agency problem. It's a, it's, a, it's a problem all levels of government really need to work together to solve. Yeah, I, I'd agree with a lot of that. I mean, I do write about safety in the book, and it's absolutely true that per the perception of safety is really important. But there's rarely a one-size-fits-all solution because what people perceive as safe can differ so much based on which riders you're talking to. You know, for some people, the presence of police makes them feel safe. For many others, it makes them feel less safe and it heightens anxiety. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one, one solution that does seem really important is non-police personnel in the Bay Area. For example, you have the precedent of the elevator attendees on BART, which has made a difference on, uh, on public perception there. There's a lot of research suggesting that uh, perceptions of transit safety really have a lot to do with design and the built environment, things like whether there's lighting at bus stops. And then I, I agree with um, you know, what Christoph said about that this is a, an upstream societal problem that's falling on to transit agencies. Here in New York City, um, the MTA has just made the decision to close the subways overnight, and a lot of people really view that as a, it's not really about cleaning, which is what they claim, it's actually about trying to get unhoused people out of the system. But the shelter system in New York is not safe. People are, people have to, you know, sleep within three feet of each other. It's no surprise that people are not choosing to go into that system. And simply, you know, what's happening is that the unhoused people on the subways, they're getting kicked out of the system, and many of them, you know, just have to sleep on the streets and wait for the system to reopen. It's not really helping anyone because it's not a problem that can be solved strictly through transit. Um, there are some examples. Uh, SEPTA also comes to mind. They actually have a service center inside one of their major transit stations. Um, there certainly are, I, I'd also heard that the, the Twin Cities is doing a good job of actually, you know, when they are, um, they're actually taking unhoused people to some hotel rooms that have been set aside in this moment. Um, I think the most important thing to do is really to have community-based conversations about what safety means for riders. And then what you often hear is much more complex than security as the answer. Yeah, agreed with all of that. Okay, um, here's one, on equity, given that most people don't understand what makes good transit, how can advocates best educate and bring in allies, marginal? as allies marginalize individuals and communities without coming off as patronizing and whitewashing? I, I think not um, being patronizing is so incredibly important here. And, and that's why I keep pointing out that, that the things I'm talking about are basic and easy to understand. We're not coming here from here's the wisdom of transit planners going to you, the community. We're actually saying that you, the community, already understand what makes good transit, and we're here to help you talk about it and to help you tell those stories. Um, there is this huge divide I often see in advocacy. I think there are definitely advocacy groups which are out of touch, which are focused, which are telling the wrong stories. And the only way to bridge that is to actually spend time talking to each other. 
um, and nothing else substitutes for that. Um, and in the places where I have seen this work well, it's really the best advocacy groups are built on a community of writers and are expressing the needs of that community of writers and take that absolutely seriously, that it's not grassroots advocacy as a sort of window dressing, but it is actually articulating what they're hearing from people. And what's interesting about that is things do work out differently in different places. We never want to come in as planners and think we understand a neighborhood better than the people who live there. What we want to come in as planners and say, Here's an understanding of a set of tools. Let's figure out what works here. Um, but overall, like this is one of those divides we can overcome. Like this is this is one of those things where I think good advocacy groups can be enormously effective at amplifying the voices of communities which have often not been heard. Which is a big part of the problem here is that a large portion of the people who ride transit are coming from communities where they're not used to government even caring about what they need. They're not used to even asking for enough. Um, and I think that's part of what a good advocacy process does too, is it is it empowers everybody to really see there's an ability for things to be better, not just for things not to get worse, but for things to genuinely get better. And there's a level of ambition there for this is what it would truly mean to make this transit work for us. And if you can get that conversation started, I think you can get really wonderful results. Yeah, I just wanna underscore one thing that Christoph just mentioned there, which is that transit riders really do intuitively understand the problems with transit. and maybe not every writer is familiar with a solution like transit signal priority but they're very familiar with the pro with a problem like a bunched bus yep. or that you know it feels unsafe to walk to the stop and then it feels unsafe to wait there so it's really easy to just speak with people in to speak with people, you know, in in real terms and get a common understanding of the problem, um, and in most places, you know, in most places where I've seen transit get better, transit riders were actually um, highlighting these challenges and issues with the system long before, um, you know, government or planners got involved. You know, just for example, in the you know the Houston bus network redesign, there was there was a lot of survey data from years yep. before showing that bus riders wanted a better bus system, and I think that is the case in a lot of places. And so I think it is very very possible to build those relationships to educate when needed, but but it's a lot of um, I think really important to think about who actually gets the ability to speak and be a spokesperson. And it's really important to involve writers themselves. Yeah, and, and and genuinely listening, like I think that example from Houston is such a good one because what the agency was doing was a long range planning process, sort of asking the question like, where should we build rail lines for the next 20 years? And when it was asking the public those questions, the answers were coming back like, I would like more frequent bus service. I would like a bench at my bus stop. And normally what agencies do when they do when they get those kind of responses is to say, I'm sorry, this is a capital planning process and that's not the question we were asking. And instead what Metro did is these responses are telling us we're asking the wrong questions and that we really need to be prioritizing what we're hearing from our riders as what matters to them. And the interesting thing about that is ultimately it has led to the long-range planning the redesigning of the bus network in the end became the basis for a long-range plan but we reordered the priorities based on what we heard from the actual riders and and that's why we got a good outcome so it's for advocates and agencies alike genuinely listening rather than just asking and listening for the answers you think you're going to get really matters Great, thank you. We've been really getting a lot of excellent questions today. Do you mind if we go over a little bit? Okay, excellent. 
I would like to ask a few more general questions and then we have some up about relative to COVID. Um, so thank you for your examples of cities and transit agencies that are bridging the gap between transportation engineers and transit operations. Do you have any ideas of how structurally how to bridge that gap at state DOTs for transit on state right of way? Mm. Mm. It, it, there is, I mean, the divide between agencies is one of our biggest problems. Um, the, and, and this is frankly part of why U.S. bus systems are as bad as they are. Um, because transit agencies like things like rail lines where they sort of control everything. And when it comes to making local bus service better, transit agencies have to work with cities. And, and often that's where things fall apart. Um, and the places where you're seeing these improvements happen, Stephen gave the example of Boston, are cases where you're seeing these partnerships being created. But that means that transit planners and street designers and highway planners have to get together and start talking to each other. Um, and that just like the advocacy discussion we just had is not something that's going to happen automatically. Um, and I think there's some good examples in all of those places of staff who are making that effort to start those conversations and build those relationships um, and say, how can we work together? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have an answer, but you know, specific to the 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 challenge of state departments of transportation. I feel like what it often has tended to look like between cities and transportation agencies is first it starts with leadership commitment at both of the agencies that you know we have to coordinate on transit. Then there's often a more type of informal working group. Sometimes it then becomes more sort of semi-regularized that you know maybe there's a, a bi-weekly meeting between folks in both agencies working on transit issues. And then it then it becomes even more formalized, sometimes in the form even of, uh, of MOUs and things laying out, okay, for a transit priority project, the city will pay for this and the transit agency will pay for that. And then it leads to this kind of internal capacity building where at the transit agency, maybe you actually have a, a street unit and in the at the city, you have a transit unit. It, it, it tends to go in that order. And I could at least imagine that it could happen at a state department of transportation, but I think it really starts with leadership buy-in um, to help, you know, to help uh, create the impetus for it. And I'll note, I mean, one thing that is happening at some states um, is that state departments of transportation are realizing that they have resources and expertise that can be of real help to mid-size and smaller transit systems um and you know you you look at a you know you look at a state like maryland and obviously there's the big transit operations there's you know you can talk about baltimore you can talk about the dc suburbs but then there's you know cities like frederick that have their own little bus networks and often those small agencies don't have that level of capacity and sometimes state DOTs can actually do amazing work in both touching state DOT projects and saying, there's a bus stop here. Let's talk about what our statewide standard is for a bus stop. But also in working with those small transit agencies and finding opportunities to work together and finding opportunities for the expertise that the state has to be leveraged across these small agencies that don't have that kind of staffing, but don't have that kind of funding. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and I see some states starting to do that, um, but we shouldn't leave DOTs out of this discussion. Um, and we shouldn't leave the smaller agencies out of this discussion. Yeah, Virginia is actually a good example of that. My understanding is that, um, you know, when Richmond, they, they have a bus rapid transit project there, and it's actually the state DOT took over a lot of the project management of that because, they actually did have the transit expertise and they were able to, you know, do a better job of keeping it, you know, closer to time and budget. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. I'm curious about what the thresholds for justifying better public transit are. In my home borough of Staten Island, we're repeatedly told we're simply too small or not dense enough to justify better transit. Though it's the smallest borough, it's nearly a half million people with greater density than a city like Seattle. Are there thresholds? Are these thresholds a moving target or are they relative in some way? I mean, there are some basic thresholds and 
there's been books written about, you know, what is the cutoff or fixed route bus service. Um, they're all generalizations to some extent. Um, but I mean, I would agree on Staten Island. Like, I would agree in that in a larger sense in New York metro area as well, that if I look in the book at the biggest gaps between what I mapped was frequent service. So a 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes or better, um, like 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And one of the biggest gaps I saw in frequent transit service in the entire United States was just outside the city limits of New York City and as well as Staten Island, um, where if you look on Long Island, you look up in Westchester, if you look um, in Newark and the surrounding cities, places like Elizabeth and Orange, there's a transit service there. Um, I think sometimes the problem in a place like Staten Island is there's a tendency to jump to the big projects. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion of rail on Staten Island. You know, here's a North Shore branch, we should reactivate that. And so I would actually think that in a lot of cases that the kind of tools we're seeing smaller places use may be a lot more relevant there. Like let's let's look at bus lanes, like let's look at more frequent service, let's look at a at a street running BRT line. Um so I think sometimes that's kind of the hard thing in a in a place like New York metro area, and I see the same thing in the Bay Area, in a place that's big enough that there is a rail network, everybody tends to have discussions about rail and, and leave off often very achievable transit projects um, that are much easier to put on the ground and maybe much more suited to that level of density. Because no, Staten Island isn't the level of density of Brooklyn or the Bronx where you would really need subway lines to cover everything. I think you could do a lot of really good transit there though. Yeah, the New York metro area is definitely a place where this, you know, somewhat artificial distinction of urban and suburbans really harming, you know, what we think of as viable transit neighborhoods. And if you go to a place like Long Island, for example, there is such tradition in the political discourse of people saying, well, we don't want to be queens. And that's why we're not going to build apartments. That's why we're not going to improve transit. But the actual result is lots and lots of people stuck with poor bus service and also biking really in the margins of the transportation system. Yeah. And, and a big problem in place like Staten Island, too, is generally the political decision makers have a windshield perspective on the world. Um, and it, it's amazing how much even in New York City, the prioritizing the needs of drivers over transit riders shapes this kind of politics and is actually why we're not discussing the projects that are most useful and also when those projects are discussed why they get pushed back you know i think some of the best solutions to transit on staten island would probably involve losing some on-street parking spaces and does the politics of staten island allow that Okay, thank you. Um, is there information, whether formal data or anecdotal, regarding how ride sharing has impacted or not impacted the appeal of pub public transit over the last few years? I think one of the most important things, one of the most important results of the boom in ride hailing is that it's one of the factors that has driven the return of you know, the, the continued increase of traffic congestion in some of the densest neighborhoods. Um, Uber, Lyft, you know, transportation network companies, as they call themselves, are really a direct competitor for some transit trips, and they're worsening traffic in the places where transit is most needed. And I think the response to that has to be really proactive. Uh, transit, you know, on-street priority to give transit that on-street right-of-way. Um, and I think that there, there's quite a lot of, um, you know, there, there wasn't data on that for a while because the private companies were very reluctant to share the data, but there have been some very convincing, more recent studies uh, showing that uh, those companies are doing a lot to drive up uh, traffic levels, or, you know, they were before the pandemic world that we live in. Yeah. And I think there is definitely 
I think transit agencies have been sort of, in some cases, over quick to blame Uber and Lyft for declines in transit ridership. There are definitely some cases where I think transit has lost ridership, and that seems to be most pronounced off-peak. Like it seems in DC, for example, there has been a decline in metro ridership in the evenings, which can be partially attributed to ride hailing. My answer to that is always, that is a sign of providing bad transit service. In other words, the ridership is being lost at times of the day where the headways were the longest, where the times people spent waiting for trains were the longest, and where people were saying, I don't want to deal with that. I'm just going to pull out my phone and 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 call call an Uber, and it's just all the more reason why transit agencies need to pro focus on providing good service. If somebody else, if somebody's choosing another mode of transportation instead of your agency, you should ask, what can we do to make the service better so that people want to ride it? Okay, so now we'll move into a couple questions about COVID before we end. So how will COVID-19 change transit ridership? What should agencies do now to help mitigate for further drops in ridership after everything starts to go back to normal? Well, I'll say one thing. To there's a short-term and a long-term question on this. And I think short-term, there's a good amount of speculation we can do about how quickly people will return to transit, how whether people will fear that they will get infected if they ride transit and people will use cars instead. But I think those factors pale in comparison to the long-term impacts. And my biggest concern on long-term impacts is funding and service. That I think I have a very real fear that the temporary cutbacks we have seen due to COVID will lead to permanent cutbacks. And they'll lead to permanent cutbacks simply because of the strain all of this is putting on municipal budgets and the recession we have now started, what that recession will do to municipal budgets. But also because one of the things we've seen over and over again is that sometimes almost a effect that once service gets cut, it's really hard to get back. That's sort of the political impetus for that is gone. So I have a real worry that one of the outcomes of COVID is a series of political decisions which will lead to worse transit um, and which makes the advocacy all the more critical right now. Because if we're not paying attention to that, we could actually see decades of work in trying to improve transit undone by elected officials not prioritizing transit in the recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's exactly my read on it. Transit agencies are in a really tough position right now where there are, in order to safeguard public health, agencies are doing a lot of really important work to, you know, provide protective equipment, clean the service, and we're in a situation where ridership is declining, you know, to some cases a very dramatic effect, ridership declines of 90% or more. But transit agencies still have to run a lot of service in order to provide enough service to enable people to safely distance. And the federal government did provide uh, $25 billion for transit in the CARES Act. But it's likely that in a lot of major metro areas, that may only cover a few months of you know these levels of expenses. And you know, we are also perhaps headed into an economic downturn that is really proving to us that a lot of the traditional ways that we fund transit, whether that's fares or you know, sales taxes or other dedicated taxes, these are all really fragile, you know, it's a fragile foundation. For service and we saw some of that in the years after the great recession where the years after that recession were marked by pretty severe transit cuts we may be into something you know we may be facing a future that's much more challenging than that unless there's a different political response it actually is i mean it's a little bit encouraging to me that we saw such a we saw this um you know, rescue funding for transit because there was nothing like that really in 
the Great Recession. Yeah. And so this is a really important precedent, but there's no guarantee that there'll be, you know, more of it coming. And it's 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 certainly needed. Yeah, and I, and I I think there is a real tendency to overestimate the impacts of tragedies and crises. Like I, I'm seeing a lot of sort of think tank thinking out there of maybe this will permanently pull people away from transit. Maybe people won't want to live in cities anymore. And if you look at the history of major urban, just major, major disasters in society in general, that is not borne out. After the 1906 earthquake, San Francisco rebuilt itself. Um, 9-11 did not result in people stopping working in high rises or stopping flying in airplanes like plenty of people predicted that it would um i think everything that makes cities work is still relevant and people this moment will pass people will still want to live in new york city people will still want to live in apartments people will still want to live in tra in in um will still want to ride transit but i am seeing a whole group of people right now who are tell, trying to tell a different story, who are trying to say that this is the end of transit, this is the end of cities. And it's noteworthy that a lot of those people's paychecks are coming from people who would financially benefit from the end of transit and the end of cities. There's a real ideal, ideology in there. And we're seeing some of the same anti-transit arguments we've been seeing for decades suddenly repackaged for COVID. Um, and so I think transit advocates really have to push back on that. And I also feel like it's incredibly important that transit agencies not adopt optimism as their response. One of the things I think highway agencies are incredibly good at is highway agencies always keep marching forward. Like once there's a line on the map in a highway agency's mind, that line will never go away. And highway agencies never have canceled projects. They only have postponed projects. Um, and ever, all of the planning that happened pre-COVID is marching forward. And you can make every bit of argument about, you know, what this does to traffic is what you can do to transit. But that's not the discussion that, that highway groups are having. Highway groups are having the discussion of let's keep going. Um, and so I think it's really important for transit advocates and transit agencies to still be thinking about a world with better transit. Because if we don't think and talk about that world, that world won't happen. I was really surprised to learn yesterday, I was part of an event with uh, Heather Thompson, who works for an international nonprofit, the um, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Uh, they are seeing that in some cities in China, transit ridership has actually already rebounded to 80% of pre-COVID ridership. And that is that really has a lot to do with confidence in the public health measures. Yes. And obviously there are things that that, that um, the Chinese government is doing that we probably wouldn't accept here, like, uh, you know, temperature checking at stations and, you know, sort of QR code system, but, it, but to that lets you in if, you know, if uh, the, the system, you know, sees that you are not, um, not sick. Um, but it's just a reminder that a lot of this has to do with, you know, non-transportation issues and that, in the transit world, we're dealing with a lot of challenges that have to do with upstream failures, you know, the sort of federal government failure to secure PPE, for example. Yep. And if we are able to do things like build out contact tracing, that'll have a lot, that'll have a big effect on people's confidence level. No, and it's notable that some of the places in the world that have actually dealt with COVID the best are dense transit oriented places. Uh, if you look at South Korea, if you look at Taiwan, clearly transit isn't the problem. And clearly um, transit can be part of the solution to cities continuing to function. Um, and I will say one other thing that just this crisis is, I think, happily done, is spotlighted the people who actually operate transit. Being a bus driver is one of the hardest jobs in the world. It's an incredibly difficult job. It's a job that has real risks even before COVID. Um, and it's so incredibly important to the functioning of our city. So I do hope that all the transit advocates are are taking this chance to, to be thankful for the people who actually keep these systems running and are right now are literally risking their lives to keep these systems running. <laughs>
Thanks, Krista. So on that note, as a, as a last question about trans, transit advocacy, what impacts to transit advocacy, if any, do you anticipate as a result of all of this? Mm. The thing that I worry about is that even before the crisis, you know, it, it's, it's always a, it's a struggle to work for a nonprofit organization, to work on advocacy issues. And even before the crisis, I was worried, you know, as someone who works for a foundation myself, that um, I'd really like to see more foundation interest in, in structural change, in advocacy for transit as an environmental solution, as opposed to the incredible emphasis that often exists on electrification. Um, some of the groups that I profile in the group that do some of the most amazing work really are shoestring organizations. And I think that um, for us in the foundation world, now is is really a time to try and, and, and lean in and, you know, make sure that these organizations can keep going. On the more optimistic side, one thing that I've directly observed is that this moment is creating new coalitions and new partnerships. And a lot of it actually does have to do with labor. You know, Christoph noted that this moment is really spotlighting the role of transit operators and transit workers, we are seeing a lot more cooperation between transit unions and transit advocates. And of course, there are a lot of things where there's common, there are common interests for both riders and workers. So I think that is, um, you know, that's, that's encouraging. It's something that we will need both in this moment and beyond. I don't really think I have anything to add to that. I think that was a really good answer. Great. Well, thank you both. So as we um, end today, uh, we have posted your Twitter handles on the Q&A slide. So anybody who has any other questions can reach out to you that way or by email. Do, uh, do you have any closing thoughts based on all of the ground we covered today? Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, it's funny sometimes, I feel like this is something that Christoph may have actually said when I, because I did interview Christoph for the book, that, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, winning transit change is, is a lot of work and it requires a lot of people working together. And at the same time, as an individual person or as a group that's maybe just a handful of volunteers, you really can build the power to change the conversation about transit in your city. I have always found that really encouraging. Yeah, I, I will echo the same thing that in city after city, the story of making transit better is the story of a handful of people in a variety of different positions who passionately care about this and who just keep pushing and it's a whole lot easier than you think um and what makes good transit is not us sitting back and saying somebody will take care of that but us standing up and demanding to be a voice in that conversation and thinking about everything we do as an opportunity to make the places we live in better i mean what what i love about transit is if you get this right you can make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people's lives better on an everyday basis. Like if you if you think about what transforming the Houston bus system did, it, it, what the difference between somebody living on an hourly bus route to now living on a bus route that runs every 15 minutes, their life is better every day. And that was a result of advocacy. And And transit is a place where we can do things in the short term that are meaningful and where we can change cities in really substantial ways in the long term. And we get there by having everybody feel like they can be part of that discussion. And so it makes me so happy to see this many people on for this session today because 
every one of you has the opportunity to make transit better in the part of the world that you're in. Great. Well, thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Stephen. I think with that, we'll go ahead and close off today's webinar. Um, this will conclude advocating for and creating effective public transit. I'd like to offer a big thank you to Christoph and to Stephen for great presentations, to everybody who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make all this happen, especially now that we're all working remotely. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org in the coming days. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Uh, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for e details on other future webinars, including Designing Cities Amid Urban Migration, Demographic Shift, and a Disappearing Middle Class with Patrick Condon on May 21st. We are working to provide you with webinars during this period of teleworking for many planners and others, so if you have a topic, potential panel, or suggestion, please include it in your evaluation or email me at michael.bayer1 at maryland.gov. Visit smartgrowth.org and watch for an email blast for more information and have a great day.